In the first video about structural equation models, uh, I gave some background to uh, what structural equation modelling is, the historical um, paths that led to its development, uh, some of the key ideas and uh, the ways that it can be applied uh, in social science settings. In this video, I'm going to talk about some of the key ideas, terms and concepts in structural equation modelling. This is important because SEM is uh, rather different to other areas of statistics. Uh, some of the ideas that are uh, important in understanding and applying SEMs uh, are quite unfamiliar. Um, and so it's important to have a grounding and a familiarity with these ideas before we move on to other applications. So in this video, I'll be talking about path diagrams, the way that we represent uh, equations and theories uh, in, in the form of diagrams in SEMS. Um, I'll talk about the difference between exogenous and endogenous variables. Uh, I'll talk about the way that structural equation modelling analyses not the raw data but the uh, variance covariance matrix of the, uh, the variables uh, that we're interested in. I'll talk a little bit about how parameters are estimated uh, using maximum likelihood in structural equation modelling um, and I'll also uh, go over how we apply what are called parameter constraints, how we, we don't always estimate uh, every parameter in the model. Some of the parameters are fixed to uh, values uh, before we start fitting the model. I'll also talk about how we assess the overall fit of a model in structural equation models um, and the importance of the idea of what are called nested models for assessing model fit. And I'll also talk a bit about uh, identification of structural equation models. Again, that's something which is linked to model fit and something that we don't uh, encounter so much uh, in uh, regression context that many people are familiar with. So, the first thing um, I'm going to talk about are path diagrams um, and path diagrams is one of the uh, reasons why structural equation modelling is, is very appealing uh, to many social scientists in particular. Um, this is because social scientists don't always have such a, a strong grounding in mathematics and are um, less comfortable with reading um, complex equations and so on. Um, and so uh, path diagrams are another way of presenting the same information as we can get in, a, in an equation, but they do this visually uh, and that's often a, a clearer way of seeing uh, what is being presented in an equation compared to uh, Greek letters and symbols and so on. So if we write our path diagrams correctly, then we can read directly between an equation uh, and a path diagram. They tell us exactly the same thing. So in this example here, um, we could write a bivariate regression equation in the usual way wh where our dependent variable y is a function of our independent variable x um, and we are going to uh, solve this equation using data and we're going to uh, solve for the unknown parameter beta. What is the relationship between um, x and y? Now we can, we can also write that same information down in the form of a path diagram, a simple path diagram uh, in this case. So we have here uh, y is now represented as a rectangle, um, x is also a, a rectangle, we have an arrow running from uh, x to y in a single direction and we have uh, a, a small circle pointing into y uh, which represents the error term in the uh, equation. And you can see there that there's a, a, a b above the line to indicate that the, uh, the parameter represented by the, 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 the straight uh, single arrow is a regression coefficient. And this is quite clear, I think, visually in the sense that what the model is implying at least is that B, that X causes Y and that there is some uh, coefficient beta which uh, uh, summarises what that causal effect is and there is an, an error term in that equation. Um, there are conventions for, um, for path diagrammatic not notation so that we use it consistently. 
Um, there are some uh, variations in, in how uh, different conventions are applied and so on, but this is the, the, the general form um, where we have a, uh, a latent variable is represented in the form of, a, of an ellipse. Um, an observed variable, some, a variable that we've actually measured in our data set directly, would be represented as in the last slide using a, a rectangle. Um, error variances are, are small circles and this, this, sh uh, this is uh, similar to a measured latent variable, it's a circular form but it's actually a small circle now and this, this uh, indicates that uh, these error terms are also latent variables but we don't actually label them, these are kind of unknown um, or residual uh, latent variables. We also uh, indicate the relationships between variables using um, lines with arrows. A curved arrow with a, 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 a sorry, a curved line with a double an arrow at each end indicates a, a covariance between two variables. We call this sometimes a non-directional path or an unanalyzed relationship because this is used to show that two variables are related to one another, but our model does not. Um, specify anything about uh, the direction of that relationship. It may be because it's not an important part of the theory but we know that the two variables are uh, associated. Lastly, a, uh, a straight line with a single arrow at one end indicates a, a directional path, a regression uh, coefficient. So we're, we're saying if we use a, uh, a single uh, headed arrow then we are indicating the direction of the relationship between two variables in our model. And we can put these uh, basic symbols together to form more uh, complex models, but ones which have a clear meaning and which can indeed be translated back into uh, the uh, standard uh, equation notation. Um, here are some examples of some quite simple uh, uh, path diagrams. Um, here we're just looking at uh, measurement models, these are uh, confirmatory factor models and we have here eta1 uh, which is a latent variable shown as an ellipse um, and eta1 here is shown to, uh, to cause three observed variables x1 to x3. And we can also think of that as, as eta1, the latent variable, being measured by uh, the observed variables x1 to x3. Um, and then at the top of the diagram we have three error variances, uh, E1 to E3. So those are the errors for each of those uh, equations that eta1 is predicting x1 with some error, uh, it's predicting x2 with some error and so on. So that's a, 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 a simple path diagram for a, a factor model um, and that could be written um, as an equation but we are in this instance using a path diagram. We can extend this to make a slightly more complicated path diagram. Now we have two latent variables, eta1 and eta2. They're essentially the same uh, diagram as we saw in the previous slide, but now we have two latent variables. And we have uh, six observed variables, six variables in rectangles, each one of which has an error term. Now we've also added in here a, uh, a curved line with uh, an arrow at each end. This is to show that the, in our model, the uh, two latent variables are correlated with one another. We're not saying anything about uh, the direction of the relationship between eta1 and eta2, we're just saying that we think that there is some kind of relationship between them. In this path diagram, we've uh, now introduced a, a theoretical statement about the direction of the relationship between eta1 and eta2. So we no longer have this curved arrow, uh, but we have a straight line with an arrow at one end. So what we're saying here is that uh, eta2 uh, is a cause of eta1. Um, and this again would be similar to the, uh, the first diagram that we saw, a bivariate uh, relationship, a bivariate regression with eta1 regressed on, on eta2, and we would then solve for uh, the unknown uh, beta coefficient uh, above the, the, the straight line uh, with the arrow at the end. Um, but, as I said, this is now uh, a bivariate regression of a latent variable onto another latent variable.
when we uh, are uh, building path diagrams and, and, and systems of, of equations, um, we in structured equation modelling we need to distinguish between two important kinds of variables, um, exogenous variables and endogenous variables. Now an endogenous variable, as the name suggests, is, is something which uh, is caused within the system. It's a variable that has, if you like, an arrow pointing into it. It is a dependent variable uh, in one or more equations. An exogenous variable, on the other hand, um, is uh, akin to uh, an independent variable in that terminology. It's a variable that um, is not caused by anything within the system of equations that we are presenting as our, as our SEM. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that we, uh, we believe that exogenous variables are, in some senses, not caused by any other variables. Um, it's simply that within our, uh, our own model, uh, the variables in the model, it doesn't have any uh, direct cause. Now an important uh, part of SEM is that uh, variables can be both exogenous and endogenous. Um, so we can have uh, a, an arrow pointing into a variable uh, making it endogenous and that variable itself can have an arrow pointing at another variable, making it an exogenous variable in, uh, in that limited sense, although it's a, now a different kind of, uh, of variable because it has uh, an arrow both pointing into it and an arrow coming out of it. And that's important because that kind of variable is a mediating variable. It's a variable which, uh, through which another uh, variable has an effect on, on a third variable. In this path diagram, uh, we can, which we've already seen, but this path diagram now we can distinguish what kinds of uh, variables these are. We've got two exogenous latent variables here. They're exogenous latent variables because uh, there is no directional path uh, pointing into either of them. Neither of them, therefore, has an error term. This is just a correlation that we're seeing here. So these are, are both exogenous in the model. Um, again, we've seen this path diagram. Um, we've got uh, a, a new distinction that we can apply to it now, though, uh, that ETA1 is endogenous and ETA2 is exogenous. ETA2 uh, doesn't have any uh, direct paths going into it. It doesn't have an error term, um, whereas ETA1 has an error term pointing into it because it's got a directional path running from ETA2. So, um, a fundamental uh, advantage of using structural equation models is this ability to represent our theories um, as uh, diagrams um, rather than using uh, uh, notation which many social scientists are less comfortable with. Another, uh, if you like, unusual feature of, uh, of SEM um, is that um, in the uh, conventional uh, practice anyway, uh, we don't analyse uh, the raw data of the observed variables, uh, but we analyse the variance covariance matrix, which we'll denote S, of those observed variables. Now, this is kind of unusual uh, and, and somewhat surprising, I think, to people when they first come across it, that um, all the data that we uh, need is just the, uh, the, the set of uh, covariances and variances of the uh, observed variables. Um, as we shall see in later videos, um, some structured equation models also use the, the means of the observed variables in addition to their uh, variance-covariance matrix. Um, so what, what are we doing with this, uh, uh, this variance-covariance matrix? Well, uh, in broad terms, um, we are trying to summarise S, the variance-covariance matrix of the observed variables, by specifying a simpler underlying structure. Um, so we're going to uh, specify a, a, a model which is in some ways simpler than uh, simply reproducing S. Um, and our model, our SEM in this sense, the simpler underlying structure, um, will uh, yield an implied variance-covariance matrix. What I mean there is that uh, if our model is true, uh, then the variance-covariance matrix that we observe should 
look like this. It should have uh, uh, th these numbers in uh, each of the cells. Um, and again, as we'll see uh, later, this uh, implied matrix can be compared to the one that we've actually observed. Uh, and that comparison, if it's uh, uh, done properly, can tell us something useful uh, about uh, how well our, our model is accounting for the data. To the extent that the implied and the observed matrices differ, then our theory, our structural equation model, um, is not doing a very good job of, 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 of telling us how this uh, data were, uh, were generated. So um, a variance covariance matrix, probably most people will be more familiar with a, a correlation matrix, but uh, here we're uh, dealing with unstandardized variables and um, this matrix shows uh, six observed variables, x1 to x6, um, and uh, they are in both the columns and in the rows of this table. Um, and the diagonal, um, which is shown in bold, uh, indicates the variance. Um, so uh, uh, the, the covariance of a variable with itself, in this case maybe x1 and x1, that gives us the variance of that variable. So a covariance of a, a variance with itself is its variance and those are shown in bold on the main diagonal. Then we see in the other cells the covariances uh, which can be negative uh, or positive uh, in the other cells of this matrix. And you'll observe that the, uh, the top part of the matrix is uh, redundant with the bottom part. So we actually only need uh, the lower part of this, uh, of this matrix. Now, an important aspect of, of any uh, model fitting, and structured equation modeling is, is, is no different, is uh, the need to uh, estimate what the unknown parameters in our models are. Um, the, the betas, what is the, uh, what is the relationship between eta1 and eta2 in the population? Now, there are different ways of, 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 of uh, estimating these parameters um, in uh, standard regression modeling we would use uh, ordinary least squares. Um, in structural equation modeling practice is uh, mainly around using a technique called uh, maximum likelihood um, and maximum likelihood estimates the unknown model parameters by maximizing the likelihood which we can denote L of a particular uh, sample of data. Now L is, uh, the, the likelihood, is a, a mathematical function which is based on the joint probability of continuous sample observations. So um, in essence, maximum likelihood uh, finds what the maximum value of L is for a particular sample of data um, and it does that by sort of iterating through using different uh, values for the unknown parameters until it finds the maximum likelihood. Once that maximum has been found, then we have produced the, the maximum likelihood estimates for the unknown parameters. Now, maximum likelihood uh, it has, it is appealing because it is uh, unbiased and efficient. Uh, now, what those terms mean are that uh, if we have a large sample, um, then our estimates of the unknown parameters will be correct. They will converge upon uh, the true values in the population. They're e efficient in the sense that no other way of doing this will give us uh, more precise estimates of those parameters. Um, now those, those two assumptions of being unbiased and, and efficient um, do themselves hinge on some other assumptions. Um, one important one is that the, uh, the data come from a multivariate normal distribution. Um, essentially, that requires us to be using continuous variables. So maximum likelihood uh, is less good when we have variables in our data set uh, that, we, that are not continuous and that we have arrows pointing into. In those situations, we need to use uh, different estimators. But for now, I'll be focusing on the simpler case of multivariate normal data and uh, maximum likelihood 
Um, now, another way in which maximum likelihood is uh, used in SEM um, is that not just in the estimation of the unknown parameters, but in use of the, uh, the likelihood, the maximum likelihood. Um, if we take the, the log of the likelihood for the, for the model, then we can use this to test how well our model fits compared to some uh, more or less restrictive alternative. So maximum likelihood uh, is used in, in two ways in SEM. One is for estimation of the unknown parameters um, and linked to that is uh, use of the, the, the log likelihood uh, to assess the way, how well the model fits the observed data. Most areas of statistics that social scientists are uh, familiar with, um, the focus is very much on estimating the unknown parameters in the model. We want to know what the, uh, the relationship between X and Y is in the population, or possibly what the conditional uh, association between two variables um, is. And so we, we focus on estimating those unknown parameters. This is also true, of course, in SEM, but in SEM we have an additional uh, focus, which is on fixing or constraining parameters to particular values bef before we uh, estimate our model. And that's a bit unusual for many people. So um, we, we can fix model parameters to any values, but uh, it tends to be the case that we will be uh, fixing parameters to be uh, the value 0 uh, or the value 1. Those are the most common uh, parameter constraints that we make in, in SEM and I'll come back to uh, why we do that later. Um, but we can also, uh, in addition to fixing parameters to these values, we can also constrain uh, model parameters to be equal to other model parameters. So we will uh, still estimate those uh, equivalized parameters but they have to be uh, estimated so that they are the same. The model uh, applies that constraint on uh, what the parameters are that are estimated. So again, that's something which is quite unusual and we don't really see that in uh, many other uh, statistical techniques that we might uh, use in social science. The, the main thing that we uh, are, are using these parameter constraints for is for the purposes of model identification. And I will be saying some more about that soon. Now I said that we can use uh, the, uh, the likelihood of our model um, to test uh, how well it fits the data by comparing our model with another model. Um, now when we do this, the, the two models that we compare have to be what is called nested, one within the other. Um, so what do we mean by, by nested? Well, it is, it's precisely this, that, that one model is a subset of the other, or the parameters in, in one model are a subset of the parameters in the other model. Another way of saying this is that if we have two models, A and B, then model A is the same as model B, but it just adds some additional parameter restrictions. So a is B plus parameter restrictions. To take an example here then, um, if model B has the form Y equals A plus B to 1 X1 plus B to 2 X2 plus E, then model A will be nested if it has that same structure but it applies a parameter constraint to the two beta coefficients that they are equal. So we now have this property that model A is the same as model B with an added parameter constraint. It is therefore nested within model B. If we consider a, a third model, model C though, and we now remove X2 from the model and we add uh, Z2 instead, then model C is not nested within model B because it isn't just model B plus some parameter restrictions. It has a new variable Z which is not uh, in model B. So these are, if you like, uh, 
apple and pear models. We, 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 we can't really, uh, in any sensible way, make comparisons uh, between the, the, the fit of Model B and of Model C because they include uh, different variables. So, I've said something about model fit already and the fact that it's based on the log of the likelihood of the model that we've estimated um, and that we can do this comparison of model fit when the two models are nested. Um, this is because if we take the, the log of the likelihood for model A uh, from the likelihood for model B, or the log of the likelihood, then that is itself, that number is itself distributed as chi-square. Um, and the chi-square distribution then has a degree of freedom uh, which is equal to the, the difference in the degrees of freedom for model A and model B. We can therefore use this chi-square distribution to test the fit of, the, of the, the first model to the second model. Now, if our value of chi-square has a p-value, uh, greater than 0 0.05, um, then we will prefer the more parsimonious model, model A. Because what we're saying here in this situation is that the, the models are not different with regard to one another's likelihood values. That We, we say that the, the likelihoods are uh, essentially uh, the same. Um, that means that we will prefer the model that, has, uh, that is simpler and is estimating fewer parameters. So where in this case that, that model B would be our uh, observed data, the variance covariance matrix, then we're saying that the, there is no difference between the observed and the implied uh, matrices and our model therefore fits the data well. So that's the, the essence of uh, the assessment of model fit using chi-square in structural equation models. We can uh, look at the, uh, the difference in the likelihood for one model and compare it to the likelihood for uh, a, a nested model and make a, uh, a statistical test of whether one fits the data better than the other. So the last thing I'm going to talk about in this video is model identification. Uh, this is all linked with uh, the things I've talked about already uh, to parameter constraints and, and fixing parameters to particular values and to assessing model fit and so on. So what is model identification? Well, uh, in conceptual terms, um, we need to have enough known pieces of information in an equation uh, to produce unique estimates of unknown parameters. Now we need unique estimates, um, otherwise we don't know which ones uh, to prefer. So um, to give an example uh, of what we mean here by the balance between uh, known and unknown pieces of information, if we look at these two equations, the first of these is uh, unidentified. We have x plus 2y equals 7, so what we would want to do is to find the unique value uh, that satisfies uh, that equation uh, for y. Now, um, because we have um, a balance of knowns and unknowns where uh, x and y could really take on many, many, many different values and they would all be uh, uh, true, if you like, in terms of the, the equation being correct, that equation is unidentified because it doesn't enable us to uh, produce unique estimates. Now, if we change that equation slightly, where we, we, we now are not having x as an unknown and we make that 3, um, then um, we can only have one value for y, which is 2, um, in a way that will satisfy that equation. So that equation then is, is identified. Um, now, uh, that is the, the essence of uh, what we uh, need to understand about identification is that it's to do with the, the balance between um, the, uh, the number of known and unknown pieces of information um, in an equation. Now, um, there is something else to know about identification which is that it's a, a theoretical property of the model. Um, it's not really linked 
to uh, to the data as such, so we can we can figure out what the uh, identification status of a particular model is uh, without having any any data or estimating any parameters. Um, but um, it's also true to say that a a model can be theoretically identified, um, but empirically unidentified given a particular set of data. So um, we are looking at the balance between the known and the unknown pieces of information in our, in our equations um, and in SEM the known pieces of information are the variances and covariances and means, if we're using means in our model, of the observed variables. We, we, these are the known pieces of information. The unknown pieces of information are the parameters that we want to estimate uh, in the model. Now, models can have different identification status. Um, a model can have, uh, as we saw a moment ago, uh, more unknowns than knowns. That means that it's unidentified. We can't produce unique uh, values uh, for the unknown parameters. So that's an unknown, uh, an unidentified uh, model. Other models can be just identified where the number of knowns is equal to the number of unknowns. We don't have any uh, what we call over identifying uh, uh, restrictions on the model um, and therefore we, in, in, for, for just identified models, we don't have any likelihood for the model that we can use uh, to assess its fit. Now most of the models that people are, uh, are familiar with using, again ordinary least squares regression, those kinds of models are uh, just identified. Um, the third level of st identification status is over identified models and that's usually what we are uh, trying to uh, get to um, and deal with in SEM and that's where the, the number of knowns um, is greater than the uh, number of unknown parameters in the model and that means that we can uh, assess the, uh, the fit of the model um, as well as estimating the unknown parameters. So there are different ways that we can um, assess the identification status uh, of a model. Uh, a very simple one these days with uh, modern computers is simply to uh, to run our model uh, and uh, most software will uh, tell us uh, what the identification status is of the model even before we fit the data. So it's quite easy uh, compared to how things were done in the past uh, but nonetheless it, it's still useful to uh, to have a consideration of the uh, identification status of a model uh, as it helps us to understand uh, where things might be going wrong if we have a problem and we, uh, we, 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 our model is unidentified, uh, working through it in this way can, can help us to see why. So um, here's the uh, accounting rule that can be used where if we uh, have uh, S as the number of observed variables in the model um, and the number of non-redundant uh, parameters um, is given by this equation which is a half of S uh, times S plus 1, again S is the number of observed variables, um, and T um, is the number of parameters that we are going to estimate in the model, the number of unknown parameters. So if T um, is greater than uh, the uh, answer to this equation, um, then our model is unidentified, we have more unknown parameters than we have non-redundant parameters, and if it's less, uh, then we have an over-identified model. So, to give an example of that, um, here is the path diagram that we saw earlier where we have eta1, uh, a latent variable, which is uh, measured by or causing three observed variables and uh, each of those observed variables has an error variance. So, uh, if we want to uh, find the number of non-redundant parameters, we can use our half s uh, times s plus 1 uh, equation. Now we have s here is equal to 3. So s times uh, s plus 1 is 3 times 4, that's 12. If we take half of that, it gives us 6 as the number of non-redundant parameters. Now, how many parameters are we trying to estimate with this model? Well, uh, three variances, one for each error term, 
uh, we've got two factor loadings. One of them you'll see there is uh, constrained to one. Um, so we're fixing that loading um, and that is uh, uh, for identification of the model. So we're, we're not estimating that factor loading, um, but we are estimating the other two. So we have two factor loadings. And then lastly, we have uh, a variance for the latent variable. So three plus two plus one, uh, is six parameters to be estimated, which is the same as the, the number of non-redundant parameters. So we have, with this model, zero degrees of freedom. The model is just identified. So we can estimate the unknown parameters, but we do not have any way of assessing uh, the, the fit of this model, because it's just identified, no degrees of freedom. Now, Something else that's uh, important to understand about identification is that uh, we, as the, the, the analyst, can control, uh, 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 to some degree, the identification status of our model. So we can, uh, we can do this um, for a, a model like the one that we just saw that's just identified or a model that's under-identified by adding more known pieces of information to the equation or uh, by removing some unknown pieces of uh, information, removing uh, uh, parameters that are to be estimated and adding constraints. So um, if we were to uh, constrain two of the parameters in the model to be equal to one another, let's say we constrain two of the, 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 the regression coefficients or the factor loadings to be equal, um, now we're only estimating one parameter where previously we were estimating two. So we've removed one unknown and gained one degree of freedom. Now we can see this uh, in this model here um, where we have added an additional observed variable to the previous path diagram. So now the model is essentially the same but we've got a fourth observed variable x4. Um, we now are, are estimating um, an additional factor loading and an additional error variance, but we have uh, gained uh, more in terms of our uh, known parameters. So now if we use our half s times s plus 1 equation, um, s is now 4, so 4 times s plus 1, 4 times 5 is 20, we take half of that, um, now we have 10 non-redundant parameters in this model. Um, and we have 4 plus 3 plus 1 parameters to be estimated, 8. So 10 minus 8 gives us 2 degrees of freedom. So by adding that fourth um, observed variable, our model is, is now over-identified and we can say something about the fit of uh, that model to the, uh, uh, to the variance covariance matrix that we've observed. So in that example, uh, we changed the identification status of our model by adding in uh, more known, another known piece of information, another observed variable. Another way of uh, changing the identification status is to remove unknown parameters. Now here, in this example, we are now not estimating the two uh, factor loadings that we were in the first example. So we, you can see there's a number one next to each of the uh, arrows for the factor loadings. So rather than estimating those, we're saying these are all equal. Now, this may not be a, a very theoretically meaningful thing to do. This isn't the point um, at this particular juncture. What we're showing here is that uh, you can change the identification status of the model by removing unknown. So we're not estimating these anymore. So we still have six non-redundant parameters, but we now are only estimating four unknown parameters because we uh, are not estimating any of the factor loading. So now this model is over-identified. So in this video I have uh, covered some of the uh, important ideas and concepts uh, that learners will need to take with them into uh, later uh, videos and applications. These are uh, focused around the use of path diagrams for representing our theories and, and our equations, the fact that we uh, analyse the variance-covariance matrix of the observed variables rather than 
uh, the raw data, uh, that we use uh, for the most part maximum likelihood estimation um, which has some re quite restrictive assumptions about multivariate normality but nonetheless is a, a, a very useful uh, estimator. Um, it gives us uh, consistent, unbiased and efficient estimates of the unknown model parameters and allows us to uh, do global tests of the fit of the model to uh, our data. Um, those kinds of uh, fit tests are mainly applicable in the context where models are nested, where we can say that uh, uh, one model is a subset of uh, a second model, that it is the same as the second model with some additional parameter restrictions. Um, and I've talked about identification of models and models that can be uh, under-identified, uh, just identified and over-identified and how we as the, uh, the analyst can exert some control uh, over the identification status of our model by removing unknown parameters or adding in more known parameters.